God had been feeding them with manna, just a 30 second synopsis of what we read. God had been feeding them with manna, the people who were greedy said, we're sick of manna, we want to eat meat. God told Moses, great, you will eat meat for a whole month. And Moses said, I don't think you understand, there are 600,000, that's just of the men of military age, plus the women and children. So there are two to three million people out here in the wilderness. Where are you going to get herds and flocks to feed two to three million people for a month? If you remember the story, the quail blew in. When they gathered the quail, they, it says that every person gathered 10 homer. A homer was 11 bushels. That's 110 bushels per people. Isn't that amazing? Okay. So in, they ate meat. And the, the, the question that the Lord asked Moses when Moses said, do you know how many of us are out here? He said, is my power limited? Is my arm short? Now in Psalm 78, we're going to pick up reading of a psalm written about the same experience. First, Psalm 78, verse 24. He rained down manna upon them to eat and gave them food from heaven. Man did eat the bread of angels, and he sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power, he directed the south wind. When he rained meat upon them like dust, even winged fall like the sands of the sea, then he let them fall in the midst of their camp, round about their dwellings. So they ate and were well filled, and their desire he gave to them. Skip to verse 32. In spite of all this, they still sinned, and they did not believe in his wonderful works. Sort of hard to believe such a short memory, right? Guess what? We're prone to that ourselves. Okay? Verse 40. How often... They rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. And again and again they tempted God or tested God and they pained the Holy One of Israel. I'd like to read that verse in the New King James. It says, they limited the Holy One of Israel. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited. How would you like to limit the Almighty? Try the hands of the Almighty. Says that's what they did. The Holcomb, or Holman Christian Standard Bible says they constantly tested God and provoked the Holy One of Israel. And the easy to read version says, do we have that version? If we don't, don't worry about it. But, it, but the point is, it, it, they limited God through their unbelief. Now let's go back to verse 42. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the hand of the adversary. He redeemed them from a land of Egypt where he was the most powerful king on earth, and they forgot it. And you say, well, how does that relate to me? Egypt is a type of sin. He redeemed us from a terrible, terrible damnation. Amen. We richly deserved hell. We, we will not know until heaven the mighty work of God it took for us to go from right sinners to glorified saints. Amen. And this is the, he, they forgot how he had redeemed them. This year, God wants our lives expanded beyond the limits where we lived last year. But these verses tell us that not believing and not remembering what he's already done for us will keep the limits on. Now we're going to do about a five minute or maybe three minute review. We're going to talk about how you limit, literally take the limits off your understanding of what God can do in your life. Last week we read three places where the Lord asked three great men of God the same exact question. When the Lord told Abraham and Sarah they were going to have a child at the ages of 90 and 100 respectively, Sarah laughed. She thought that was too, too funny. Do you know what the Lord said? No, it says 18. Let's read it up here, verse 13. As the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything... Too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you, and at this time next year, Sarah will have a son. You may not be thinking of having a baby at the age of 90, 
But if, if we stand up here and say, God wants you out of debt by this time next year, something in you said, yeah, right. Uh, you just laugh, okay? No, don't get mad. I'm trying to help you here. I'm not trying to hurt anybody, okay? When I tell you that, God is saying one thing. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? Would you be willing to believe that there's nothing too difficult for God? Okay. When the Lord told Moses, you shall eat meat for a whole month. Let's read, read in Numbers 11, 21 what Moses said. But Moses said, the people among whom I am are 600,000 on foot, and yet you've said I will give them meat so that they may eat for a whole month? Should flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to be sufficient for them? Or should all the fish of the sea be gathered for them to be sufficient for them? Yeah. And what does the Lord say? The Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power limited? Come on. Now you shall see whether my word will come true or not. And we know it did come true. Yeah. And then in Jeremiah 32, 26, the Lord asked Jeremiah the same exact question. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, next verse, is that the only verse I gave you? The next verse says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? You can look it up later. That's what the next verse says. I know it by heart. Say, I am the Lord, of God of all flesh. Say that. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? <laughs> he asked Abraham that. He asked Moses that. He asked Jeremiah that. And he's asking us that. In fact, we saw last week that when the God of the universe took on flesh, he asked the mighty one of Israel took on flesh. Yes or no? That's who Jesus was. He asked a slightly different version of the same question, Matthew 9, 29. Two blind men came to him. And um, I didn't give the right verse again. I'm doing great here. Anyhow, the verse before it says, Do you believe I'm able to do this? Do you remember that? You can look that up too. He said, Do you believe I'm able to do this? So somebody stands up here and says, It's God's will for you to get out of debt this year. And you're like, duh, duh, duh. They don't know this and they don't know that. Boy, do they not know our history. And God says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Is anything too hard for me? So the truth is, whatever you're holding up before the Lord today, he's asking you one question. Could I do this? And your answer is either releasing or hindering the ability to God to come to your aid. When he said to those blind men, do you believe I'm able to do this? They said, we believe you're able. Their faith in his ability released his ability. Yes or no? Amen. Amen. Now, Psalm 78, verse 41 to 42, let's just read it in the New King James again. Where it says, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Stop, just pause a second. What if those two same blind men had come out and said, Lord, we want to see. And he said, do you believe we're able to, you're able to do this? And we said, probably not. Now, if they had said probably not, what would that probably not have been based on their past expectations? your past experiences. All of us face this year with a mold of expectation that is greatly colored by what we've experienced in the past, okay, and what we've expected in the past. And God wants you to take that mold and smash it and say, God, I want a new mold of my expectations and I want it to be based exactly on the Word of God. Yeah. Because the truth is you're already living a whole lot of you are living farther than far above where you ever thought you'd live your whole life. Right, yeah. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Today we want to talk about a limitless life. Life lived just as close to heaven as possible. And you say, oh, these are pretty words. No, I don't think they're pretty words at all. You see, when I grew up, I did not, I would, if you had told me it was possible to have a home without strife, I would have, <laughs> I live in a preacher's home and we have strife all the time. And I'm not enough to down on my parents. We didn't know you could live without strife. And it gets real quiet in here. Everybody listen. When you see God calling you upward, that is not condemnation. No. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who in Christ Jesus. Right? Not right. for the flesh. There's no condemnation. But I want to know you to know it is possible yeah. to live in a home with zero strife. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, did you hear about this lady that died? She died this past week. She's 114. And I saw her picture on Fox. I said, I wonder if she was a Christian. A 114-year-old South Carolina woman who was the oldest living citizen has died, two of her daughters said. She was married to a guy for 60 years who died in 1979. Can you imagine that? She's been living since 79. He's a widow. 
and they ask her about their mom, and Mamie Reardon always tells older children that they should treat each other as they wanted to be treated, and included never gossiping or speaking ill of others. When asked about a preacher's uninspiring sermon, her daughter recalled her mother saying, well, it came from the Bible, she would not badmouth it. So the next time you don't like my sermon, say, well, it came from the Bible. <laughs> This, I heard the interview with them on the, on the Fox last night, and they said, what was unusual about your mama? Now listen, if, she, if this lady's 114, you know her daughter's got the 85, 90. She's, and, and this is another thing, I didn't read you that whole article. Out of her 11 children, 10 of them are still living. Now how old must they be if she was 114? They said, she said, this is the most unusual thing about my mom. I never heard her say one unkind word about one person in her whole life. Now, most people, you know, in Hollywood, they'll do anything to figure out how to stop out of youth, how do you live a long life. I'll tell you one secret to living a very long life is to not be mad at anybody. So when you experience negative emotions, just get them out. You say, I'm a part of the kingdom of God today. I heard Brother Copeland this week, that Saturday night service there in um, Woodbridge this past fall. He said, you know, we're living in heaven now. And he's like, all right. In the spirit, we are citizens of heaven. We're sent from heaven. We're functioning on the kingdom of God in heaven now. And the closer we can get our interpersonal lives on a heavenly basis, the better our lives will be, the better our health will be. This is no exaggeration. Now, as we read, we saw that the Lord would have brought them, these very people that we read about in Psalm 78, it says they limited the Holy One of Israel, that he would have brought them straight into the promised land and made their lives a whole lot more heavenly than out in that desert. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Okay. But there, don't you love the fact that our youngsters love the Word of God? I could just run the church on that one. You know, I'm not a church runner, but I could get excited enough to run this church. Because when you get at the age of 13, 14, the Word of God excited, and there's no limits. The Lord would have brought them into the promised land, but their feeling to remember his mighty power limited the very power of the Almighty. They, their unbelief tied the hands of God. Tell the person next to you, this is getting serious. When you tie the hands of God, it's getting serious. Okay? Now, I'll tell you a secret. You cannot ask your relatives, how many of you like to do something great for God? Don't ask your relatives if you can't. <laughs> Because they all know you can't. And they're right. They're right except they leave the God factor out. When your relatives know, they know you win. But I want to tell you something. When you add the God factor in, whatever God calls you to do for God. Think about this. The folks in Nazareth lived and walked and did business with God incarnate. Did they not? The carpenter in town was God walking around with the flesh. And yet they became so familiar with him, they had no fully awe and no respect. Now my point is this. Don't ever get so familiar with God that you forget his power. Don't, don't ever take the presence of God for granted. When he comes, and just, like, it was just like New Year's Eve, his presence was there still. I'm telling you, you can get anything you want from God in those moments. Don't ever assume, listen to this, that what you've seen him do in the past is all he can do. Let's go to Mark chapter 6. Have you ever had, ever had God surprise you? Yeah. Have you ever had God do something that was way over what you were asking for? You know, your, your faith was struggling down here for a house, and then he, he went over the top and just blessed you. Some of us have been surprised by God. You can do it once, you can do it again. Mark 6, verse 1. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, they began to teach in the synagogue. And the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Let's pause for one second. Did these people know that he had extraordinary wisdom and that he performed mighty works? Yeah, yeah that should have made them think twice. Well, amen? Verse, two, or verse 3. Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And here's a, here's a side question. But did Jesus have brothers and sisters? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Now, 
Did they think they knew also that they knew, excuse me, did they think they knew all there was to know about him? Yeah. 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 Question. Do you think that you know all there is to know about him? No. no. Don't get mad at you. Do you think God might actually be able to get you out of debt? God? Do you think, sometimes when you live with a disease for 20 years or even five years, you become so part of it. It becomes so much a part of your life that you can't imagine yourself without the disease. They say, well, what do you do? You get into this word until you see that that is not his expectation for your life. Debt is not his expectation for your life. It says that the borrower becomes the lender slave. He does not want you anybody's slave but his. Amen. Hallelujah. So is it possible there's more to God than we found out? Is, he, is it possible that he's capable of doing far more than we ask or thought? Now, for example, there may be some people here that are new, and they say, well, I've never seen God move in anyone's finances. Well, first of all, when he brought in 110 bushels of meat apiece for six million, or three, two to three million people, that is a financial blessing. God has always been involved in his people's finances, okay? God can do more than he has to God. I mean, I'll wait. Let's keep reading and we'll touch that more later. Verse 4. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. As I said, don't ever let your relatives decide what you can and can't do for God. Amen. They will always decide you can't. But... You don't get mad at them. You have a hard time believing God can use them too. <laughs> right. Isn't that terrible? We limit people because we see them in the natural instead of God. Verse 5. He. Oh, wait a minute. Who's he? Is this the Holy One of Israel who's taken on flesh? The Holy One of Israel who took on flesh and tabernacled among us could do no miracle there. Except that he laid his hands on a few sick people in the Greek. That's a few people with minor ailments and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. Did these people very, very effectively limit the Holy One of Israel? Why did, why did Jesus marvel over their unbelief? You know, but if Jesus is going to marvel over me, I hope he's not sitting up there and talking about my unbelief. Because it dishonors God. When, when you, if you tell me God Almighty couldn't get me out of debt, well, how much gold is there up in heaven? How big is this God? Yeah. Are your weaknesses and poor decisions so great that God Almighty and His grace couldn't cover them? Oh, amen. Amen. Question, were mighty works needed in Nazareth? They said He could do no mighty works there in, in the New King yeah. James. They evidently were, but He couldn't do them because they limited Him. They couldn't get the power. You can, you're going to decide what you get from God this year, and it'll be by your faith. That's yeah. <clears throat> the truth is, everybody in this place is in the process of taking a promised land. Yeah. Okay? Amen. Yeah. And some of us have been walking by God for so, with God so long and been privileged to have wonderful teaching that we have actually taken a great portion of our promise. This is not pride. Now listen to me. I want you to understand that every single person here can get something magnificent out of this message. Hallelujah. And you say, but what if my finances are growing fine and I'm in health and my kids are serving God? Then it's your responsibility to take the land of revival. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Amen? Some of us are in a place where our greatest assignment on our lives is to lay hold of God for revival because it's promised and it's possible. Yeah. A limitless life. To live a lot, now, and you said, well, does that mean there's condemnation for me if all I can think about is my debt? No. God's here for you today to take the limits <laughs> off your thinking. Amen. To Amen. live a life without limits, you've got to jar your mindset and open up your thinking. Right. You have to let the word of God set your expectations. Amen. And when, when he says he is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good work. The second verse is 9 8. That's exactly where he's, and he's saying, well, yeah. what hinders? You know, when I grew up in a preacher's home, and I'll tell you how much we limited the Holy One of Israel. We just took Holy Spirit and bound him up. I mean, he was allowed to do one thing. He was allowed to wash away our sins to get us to heaven. He passed us the ticket to heaven. And when we went to sleep at night, we knew we were going to hell because we had this, that's, that's the best thing you ever get. Beyond that, he did not stop strife in our home. 
because we didn't lend, didn't expect him to. He certainly didn't stop disease. My parents had operations, and I had the measles so bad about dying. My daddy was a preacher and never prayed for me. Oh, we didn't know it. But our unbelief held God in bondage. There's nobody here that has totally, completely, 100% taken the limits off God and said, here, God, do whatever it is. Right. Right. Yeah. Hallelujah. What can he do? He'll get you out of debt. Look at what Proverbs 22, 7 says. I, and I'm not preaching this for me. I'm not in debt. I'm so grateful to Brother Kenneth Copeland who taught us when I was 20 years old to owe no man anything but to love him. He said, why are you so grateful? Because we were free to obey God. Yeah. We've had friends who wanted to go on the mission field, and they had $37,000 of credit card debt, and their lives were not their own. You see, you, your life is not yours. I know. Yeah. I'm trying to help you here. Yeah. Read this with me. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. Yeah. There's this obvious implication for our nation. I don't want my grandkids to, any, to be any nation slave. That's why we still have to speak up. Just, we're going against the grain. But I want to tell you something. There's something about a move of God. Yeah. There, yeah. The, when the Holy Spirit moves, he breaks chains supernaturally. There's nothing natural about the Holy Spirit of God. If we could get a move great enough in the United States, he would break this, this horrible debt problem that we've created. He's big enough. Yeah. He has the resources to. Yeah. So what could God do if you took the lid off your expectations? One, get you out of debt. Two, he will enable you to live in a pain-free body, strong enough to do your whole schedule. And if you say, well, it's a condemnation if I'm still in pain. No, but let the word of God, we're going to see in Deuteronomy 11, that he told them, my best for you when I bring you into the heaven, or bring you into the promised land, our days of heaven on earth. And right before that, do you know what he said? He said, I want you to take the word of God and get it in your mind. And I want you to get it in your heart. And I want you to write it on your doorpost. I want to wear, you to wear it between your eyes. I want you to, we're going to see that. And he's saying, oh, pastor, I wouldn't have time for TV if I did that. <laughs> no. I'm talking to you. Listen, what you have to do to have a kingdom expectation is to develop a kingdom mindset. Yeah, yeah. And to develop a kingdom mindset, you have to plant that, that word. We're going to be there and just, in fact, we're going to skip ahead to that. Let's go to Matthew 13. I want to go, I don't want to have to run out of time for these scriptures. When you develop a, a kingdom mindset, it is the most natural thing in the world for you to lay hands on the sick and they recover. I said, why is that? Because the God of the universe lives in you and he loves them. It's not you. Let's look at Matthew 13, 31 to 34. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the ear come and nest in its branches. Let's go back to verse 31. It says the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. What is the seed, the spiritual seed in your life? It is the word of God. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Always. That man took and sowed in his field. What is your field? It's your spirit. You take the seed yeah. and you sow it in yeah. the ground of your heart and in your life. Now what's going to happen if you do verse 32? And this is smaller than all the other seeds. Now let me tell you what that means real easy. The world does not respect it. No. They see you spending half an hour in your Bible. This society mocks. They do not know that they are mocking the most potent, powerful thing that we can lay hold of in this life. You say, oh, you're just exact. No, 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 no. I'm not This word is my love. Love of my life. You know why? Because it can change anything and everything. It's going to bring us revival. Yes. It will do anything we need it to do. If you take, you say, why is it so small? People mock it. Uh, now listen, don't get mad at me. I've got to say this. And Christians have very little respect for it. Don't get mad at me. I'm not saying you. I'm not saying this church. I'm saying, by and large, the church of Jesus Christ as a whole has had precious little respect for the word, even compared to the way the Jews do. The Jews were in such reverence for the word that before they would sit down and copy it, they would wash their hands. 
And then they, I mean, they treat it, they would sit down and copy it. If there was one mistake in it, they destroyed that copy of the manuscript and, and start it over because they understood that God's word is precious. So anyhow, it may start out looking small and insignificant. Let's read verse 32. This is smaller than all the other seeds, but, everybody say but. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. Now where was it growing? It was growing in your life and in your heart. So what started out as a promise, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, it takes root and then it grows. And then it grows, and it grows to where it becomes the biggest thing in your life. And when somebody says, God's not going to heal you, you say, are you kidding me? I'm healed. It was on Jesus. I don't care whether the devil has a few symptoms left or not. They have to go. And there's people sitting right here, right now, who were diagnosed. What were you diagnosed with? Cervical cancer? And we don't even say it for years. That's a death sentence. And the Lord led her, and don't you ever do this unless you know God is leading, to fast and pray instead of take treatments. And, it, and I got in her face over it too. And she said, Pastor, I have to do what God's told me. Yeah. And she got in to have that word to where that word became so big in her, she knew she couldn't die. You say it doesn't work. That was what, four years ago? Five years ago? 2007. Five years ago. Going on six. And, and listen to me, if you get cancer and you're not there, for goodness sake, go and get as much help from the doctor as you can while you fight the thing in the spirit. Yeah. But the word is alive. And if you tell me, I don't believe God can get me out of death, it isn't a lack of anything else but the word of God to where... Right. Yeah. Okay? So what, it, what happens is it becomes the biggest thing in your thinking. Look at verse 33. I'm really going, we have to go to Deuteronomy 11 before we quit. Because, okay, verse 33. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leaven. Now this is a little tiny bit of leaven yeah. and a whole bunch of flour. Yeah. Now that seems crazy, doesn't it? If you're going to leaven something, you use more leaven and less flour. But the Bible says, no, it doesn't even matter how small that leaven is. You keep it in there long enough, it's going to take over the whole lot. Yeah. That word will transform your whole life if you give it some time and hold on to it. Now look at verse 44. Okay. Two more verses, then we'll, we'll finish in Deuteronomy 11. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. Listen, what does that mean he sold all that he had? That means he pursued the kingdom ways and kingdom thinking with reckless abandon. If, as long as we are this world minded, we're going to be more conscious of the fact that Social Security is taking a bigger bite out of our paychecks this week than we are of anything else. That's all we're going to be conscious of. This man, for joy over the kingdom and the possibilities it contains, said, I will let go of everything else I have and am to get kingdom ways and kingdom thinking in the reality. Okay? When I found out about the Bible, I was like 21, and I heard Brother Copeland, and I saw it. I saw it. This is everything I've ever looked for right here. And I started studying the Bible day and night. My parents got looked out. They thought they needed me to get psychiatric help. They're Christians, spirit-filled. And they, but I'm going to tell you something. When you get a hold of the Word of God, there will never be any need in your life that you cannot follow and, and, and get changed yeah. with the Word of God. Hallelujah. Would you go to one other? Can we have time for two more scriptures? 2 Corinthians 4. I do want to show you this. Oh, hallelujah. In the Old Testament, a lot of places, it talks about the burden of Amos and the burden. Have you ever noticed that? God gave them a burden, and they talk about the burden, and I would always think, I wonder why they call it that. And they got to hope. Because when I come here, I have the burden in my heart of something God wants you to know. And that is that you, if you will allow the word of God to leaven all of your thinking and transform your expectations, you can get things from God you never thought were possible, but you have to give the word that permission. To pay the price. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Paul said this, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. 
in whose case the God of this world, okay, who's the God of this world? Satan. Has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who, what does he blind? Their minds or their hearts? Their minds. And whose minds does he blind? The, unbel the unbelieving. And I want to show you, I have to make it come with you real fast. I know we got Everybody has to leave. I'm not going to say this anymore. You can leave, but I've got to finish this because otherwise I'm going to go home with it. I've got to get this burden out. All right. I taught kids for 17 years. We did a lot of kids' crusades. And one of my favorite skits that we ever did was we would have a sinner, poor sinner, and we'd have a couple of demons beating at him. And we'd have some other demons pushing him down the road to destruction. And and then we'd have somebody else begin to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And as that liberating gospel came, he could see the truth, and we would dramatically, and he would kneel at the foot of the cross and get saved. <coughs> so I think. And I figured out one day when I was teaching here, that's not how it happens. It's exciting. I mean, that's one thing. He does get saved, he does hear the gospel and see light. But when we see light, it's true that we got some devils beating on us, and it's true that we got the devil trying to shove us into sin and everything else. But as the gospel is preached, some light comes in. Yeah. And you get just about enough of one peak of one eye yeah. to say, I'm going to hell. That's all you know, I'm going to hell. And then it comes to the blood of Jesus will save me from hell. Yeah. And thank God you kneel down. And you kneel down, but it's yeah. at the foot of the cross, but instead of being gloriously open visioned, you just know one thing, you are a rank sinner, deserving a devil's hell, and you're on the other way. And if that's all you ever learned, thank God. Hallelujah. But as we continue to hear the word, you're here by his stripes, you were healed. And after a while, you get such a revelation that you can walk in hell. I know a lot of Christians who walk in hell and their finances are still a mess. But the only, are you getting my point here? Every bit of gospel you get from here to eternity. I'm not as, I wasn't as free 10 years ago when I had to take over the church with Gordon I decided I am today because I got more light. Uh, Every single year, the, uh, Proverbs 4 18 says the light of the, or the path of the just is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the clear day. Yeah. That means every year there's more light. Yeah. And, but this yeah. only happens with one thing. If you will do what the Bible prescribes about the Word of God. Now, go back to Deuteronomy 11, or, yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is our last passage, but. He starts out describing the promised land. I do want to say this. When you read something in the Bible that your head says is too good to be true, and that you don't have faith for it, just quietly tell yourself, look, I may not be there yet, but it's ahead for me. Don't ever write anything on that you've seen the Bible, okay? Deuteronomy 11, we're going to start at verse 10. For the land into which you are entering to possess it is not like the land of Egypt from which you came, where you used to sow your seed and water it with your foot like a vegetable garden. Okay, now what does that mean? When life was a struggle. The only place that's green, if you look at Egypt, even from a satellite today, the only place that Egypt is green is right along the Nile. Have you ever seen a Google set? Okay? Because they have to irrigate everything. Well, when they said water it with your foot, evidently their Egyptian slave masters gave them a little pot to grow enough food to eat, eat on, but there's no way to water it, so they would have a little treadmill pump, and they would water it with their foot. Now, that's hard work, but every single drop in this arid climate, it, he says, I got it better. What does that mean to us? We all know what it's like or like to be a struggle. But when the grace of God comes in our lives, life isn't such a struggle anymore. That's right. There comes a holy ease. There comes a help from the Holy Spirit. And things that used to just blow you out of the water, you laugh at because you know how temporary they are and how Amen. much God has got to help. That is what that verse means. I'll bring you into a place where you don't have to water with your foot. Verse 11. But the land into which you are about to cross to possess it, a land of hills and valleys, drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. That means you have the Lord's complete attention. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning, 
even to the end of, your, of the year. Now, verse 13, it shall come about if you listen obediently to my commandments. Okay, you're going to live like this to help you make off. Okay, that's it, understood. It shall come about if you listen to, obediently to my commandments, which I am commanding you today, to love the Lord your God, to serve him with all your heart and all your soul, that he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early and the late rain that you may gather grain and new wine and oil. So he's talking abundance here. Now, here's my, my resolution for the new year. And that is that if I teach you something, I'm going to show you how I make it practical. Now, the problem is some of you will think that the, what's coming up is not practical prescriptions. If you go to your doctor and he hands you a prescription for the latest drug and he knows so help you, I don't like the name of that drug. He goes, they talk. That's the prescription. Now, this is not me prescribing anything. Who said this? God for Moses. All right? I want you to go to verse 18. You shall therefore impress these words of mine. Now, this is Moses talking about his words. You know why? Because all they had was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's right. right now, you shall therefore impress this word of God, right? Yeah. On your heart and on your soul. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals. the thing you wear between your eyes, on your forehead. Now watch this. You shall teach them to your sides. Talking of them when you sit in your house. When you, remember what we said about the word of God being a seed that's less than any other seed, but it grows up to take over the whole garden? Okay? The Word of God has just become the focal point of our lives. You say, why would I want that? Because it will liberate you in every way that you could be liberated. Verse 19, you shall teach them to your sons. I want to say this. You've got to go, go. But I've got to tell you this. When Nathan was little, we had good Sunday school. I didn't wait for the Sunday school teacher to teach him the Word of God. He, it should be one of the extraordinary delights and joys of your life to teach your children the Word of God. He learned to read on a wallpaper sample book with a bunch of the greatest scriptures on there, and he would quote them to me by heart, and then one day he figured out how the words went, and he, he, that's how he learned to read. But when you learn yeah. from your earliest days what the covenant says, you will resist like a t 5 to 10 percent of the fear everybody else resists. It's already gone from you. You say, this is radical. Hey, what did we read in Matthew 13, 44? It says, the kingdom of God is like a merchant who finds a pearl and sells everything he has. And we always say, what is your pearl of great price? You'll tell me Jesus. Yeah, but that says the kingdom of God. We're talking about a way of life that's so simple. We are living in the kingdom now. When you get mad, if I read you Proverbs 3, where it says, honor the Lord from your wealth. And from the first of your produce, if you get mad for reading that verse, it's because you don't understand we're kingdom living now. This is a, there is a complete interaction between the kingdoms. Verse 19, you shall teach them to your sons, talking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Could we read the next verse in the New King James? It's a little bit clearer if, in the New King James. It says that you may enjoy days of heaven. Okay. You shall write them on the twelve doorposts. Read this with me. That your days and the days of your children may be multiplied. In the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them. Like days of the heavens above the earth. Or some translations say days of heaven on earth. God's desire is for every year that we ever live to be more like living in heaven. Amen. And I just have this one thing I want to read to you because if you think, well, God couldn't possibly intervene in my finances, listen, I just want to read you this one page and we're done. Tax, in, tax increases are scary if you're only a part of this world system. But Jesus Christ never allowed taxes owed to bother him. He paid them one time with a coin in a fish's mouth. Now let me ask you this. Which kingdom was intervening when the fish showed up with a gold coin in its mouth? Which kingdom did that? The kingdom of God. That's not natural. When the fish were jumping into Peter's nets to where they filled up two boatloads, that is an interaction of the kingdom of God on earth. 
When manna came floating down from heaven and the quail of faith came by again, that's not the kingdom of heaven or earth. That's the kingdom of God. All the way through the Bible, you see the kingdom of heaven interacting like this, like Jacob's ladder. You never, ever must see your finances as only being earthly. They're heavenly if you're cooperating with heaven. That's right. When a happy meal fed 5,000, yeah. that was the kingdom of God. When the widow's oil would not run out. Why didn't Jesus Christ walk the widow to social services after she gave her last night? Why didn't she say, you need to come to head on the government? Because she was a part of another kingdom. He knew that other kingdom and keep her going. Now you say, how do you get your mind renewed to this? Exactly what it said in Deuteronomy 11. You become a fanatic. Without the word of God. The word of God, I don't care how well we're living. How many of you have to say God has raised the level of your life? <laughs> but there isn't one of us here who's living on the level promised us. I think this is exciting. If I thought I had all I could get to heaven until I got to heaven, they'd say, well, that's cool, but what now, you know? God has heaven on earth for every one of us. And you say, well, what if there's a lot of strife in my house? And you get 1 Corinthians 13 in the Amplified, talks about the love chapter, and you write it out there and you say, this is the way we live. And you say, well, we're just always used to be in charge with each other. It hurts. I don't care how used to it you are. You'll have calluses on your heart if you keep it up. If, if finances is, is, is the issue, then get in here and find the places where it says that being in debt is slavery and God doesn't want you to stay. It is the word of God that will change your thinking, that will change your mouth, and your mouth determines your destiny. Yeah. Right, right, and right. I could go on for another hour, but I've already probably always said, let's sing something. Yeah. Yeah.